Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pekulski. Thank you so much for being here. I know that you have a lot of podcasts, a lot of videos to choose from, so I don't take it lightly that you're here. We intentionally scour the world to find the world's brightest people to ultimately support you in living your greatest life in a body you love. And nutrition can be a very uh, convoluted, very confusing uh, area to discuss. So when we bring a guest on, we really try to vet them as being people who are really leading the conversation. It seems like when you really get to the top of the nutrition world, everyone's really saying the same thing. When you're kind of down lost in the weeds and the people who are maybe new or very, very polarizing, sometimes the information gets a little bit challenging. When you really kind of rise to the top, the people who have been around for a while, the people who are known to be the world's experts, they all seem to be saying pretty parallel thing. It always seems to come back to some very basic ancestral practices. And Rob Wolf is the king of ancestral practices in the ancestral community, as well as it integrated into the paleo nutrition community. Rob wrote a book that is an international bestseller called Wired to Eat, an incredible insight into how the body actually uses nutrients how sometimes person to person, the exact same food can actually have a completely different response. We discussed that book and his more recent book also, which was made into a movie called Sacred Cow, which he co-authored with Diana Rogers, a registered dietitian. And the, the purpose behind writing the book was ultimately to have a deeper understanding of agriculture and the importance of biodiversity and how maybe our agricultural practices are implicated in, um, affecting the earth versus maybe not the way we're sold in maybe the vegetarian communities. So today's conversation is really a deep dive into Rob's understanding of nutrition, biochemistry, and ultimately agriculture, and how we kind of meld all those things together to kind of land somewhere on ancestral practices and how to apply that into modern day living. We get into a little bit about the science, we get into a little bit about his practices, but overall, a ton of valuable information. Today's podcast is brought to you by bubsnaturals.com. Thank you very much to Bubs for being such a long time sponsor of the podcast. You guys love their products, so they keep showing up to support us. Uh, Bubs is world renowned for its MCT powder, which is absolutely delicious in coffee, collagen, which I add to my coffee and my post workout shakes. And sometimes I even sprinkle it over my steaks, it adds this delicious uh, texture. Um, and uh, Bubs is also known for their beauty collagen. They've also got some amazing new gummy products that are coming out and they're soon to be expanding their product line. So shout out to Bubs for hooking you guys up for the month of January with 25% off an unheard of discount in the fitness industry. Nobody ever gives 25%, but Bubs is hooking you guys up because they, you guys are long, such long-term supporters of Bubs. They want to take care of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast listeners. They want to take care of you. So head over to muscleintelligence.com slash Bubs Naturals to get 25% off one more time. That's muscleintelligence.com slash Bubs, B-U-B-S Naturals, N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S to get hooked up with 25% off. Enjoy the podcast with Rob Wolf. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Western Intelligence Podcast. I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, Rob Wolf. Thanks for joining me, buddy. <laughs> Honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. I've been a big fan of your work for a long time. I think we've, we've passed across paths a few times at some of these events. And uh, truly, it's, I think it's a long time coming, man. I'm very grateful to have you on the show. I know you're a very busy man. And you're doing some great things. And just prior to recording, we started talking about your most recent book, The Sacred Cow, which I definitely want to dive into. A lot of our listeners would know you from Wired to Eat and your theories and concepts around ancestral nutrition, ancestral living. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm absolutely, you're preaching to the choir, man. This is the stuff that I'm perpetuating. I'm, I'm getting into uh, regenerative agriculture is something that I'm studying uh, consistently now. So I'm super grateful to have you here. So thank you for being here. Awesome. Huge honor. Thank you. Yeah. So just before, before recording, we were talking about this book that you wrote, The Sacred Cow, which is kind of, in your words, a... a uh, stake in the ground against the the vegan propaganda that we're all kind of being, you know, forced to consume or like the stuff that we're told is true around, um, you know, veganism being healthy or uh, vegan uh, dieting being, or sorry, vegan nutrition being better for the, the environment and things like this. I'd love to have you just kind of dive into that. Yeah. You, you know, you would ask me the question, like, why did we do this thing? And uh, uh, it definitely wasn't to make money. Like we probably ended up uh, will, will, will when this thing sees its life cycle done, 
we'll probably end up making about three dollars an hour for the work that we we put into right. it. If if that, um, uh, we and we kind of suspected that. Like if it's not like uh, you know a fat loss book or something like you've really right. got to have a a ton of ton of traffic, ton of bandwidth to be able to to sell something like that. Um, interestingly, we we expected a huge amount of pushback from the the vegan scene and we really haven't had that like there haven't been any notable hit pieces or or anything and i think that's because we we wrote this thing over a six year period and we were very very careful we started out with a bunch of premises you know like uh, one of them which I'll, i'll try to remember to get to um pastured meat is superior nutritionally to conventional meat which ended up not really being true. Like it ended up not not being true the way that anybody in the regenerative ag scene would hope that it would be true. Oh. And and uh, and so we had to address that. So we started off with a you know a basic story that we wanted to tell, but then you know 50, 60 assumptions that would have built the you know the different pieces of the chapters and everything. Then we went through and started researching that stuff. And like with the the case of pastured versus conventional meat, you know, we we had some interesting discoveries there, but we we really endeavored to not greenwash this in a way that, you know, would be nice for continuity of story if you're totally bought in on this idea, but was actually lying to people. Right. And like uh, which is Kind of like what they do with the vegan stuff, you know. It's <laughs> yeah, like so. you'll you'll lose weight, you'll live forever, you'll be morally superior. You're not killing animals. You're going to save the environment. You're going to save the world. Um, right. I mean, who wouldn't want to sign up for that, yeah. you know? And 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 it's an elevator pitch deal. You can. I just rattled the whole thing off in less than like twenty seconds, so, you know. Right. Yeah. And for us to get into this, like part, I I had a chapter on this topic of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which it's kind of like, if you want to, if you, there's a saying that if you, if you want to cut your book sales in half, include one mathematical equation. And, and if you, you you know, if you want to cut it by like a a hundred fold, you know, have a chapter devoted to that. And so it, but we had to explain that the direction that things are going is actually antithetical to life being on the planet. Like industrial row crop food systems are narrowing the scope of life on the planet. And we actually want more life and more diversity, more biodiversity. And in order to do that, you actually need something that looks like this regenerative food system. So, so we, we kind of got in and, and did all that stuff and, and circling back around. I think that there hasn't really been a vegan hit piece on the book and the film because of, we did a really good job. Like there isn't a thing where somebody could go in and say, oh, well, they made this claim here. But then when you really read the literature, the literature says this, not that. Like there is nothing like that in there. Um, there was a little bit of early work that came out of White Oak Pastures where they were talking about the carbon sequestration of their operation. And the initial write-up attributed all of the carbon sequestration to the beef production, but it in fact was the whole production, the chickens, the composting, the, the, the whole ball of wax. And so we updated the book with that, like we put it into the second edition of the book, but we were, we were really careful to try to, to make it as credible as story as we could, which, uh, you know, is, has saved us from the onslaught of, of some of the, you know, I think the vegan backlash, but ironically, some people out of the meat elitist scene, um, were really cranky with us. So like this topic of is pastured meat more nutritious than, uh, conventional meat and the reality. And we're talking specifically about beef here. Like, um, uh, if we talk about dairy or eggs or seafood, then the the pastured forms or the wild caught form is vastly superior nutritionally. Okay. But when we're just talking about beef, it's just not. And, it, and the 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 reason for that is that things like cows with these four stomachs are so insanely good at taking crap food and turning it into amazing food, nutrient upcycling. Mm. Like they're just insanely good at that. And there's a slight difference in the amount of omega threes between pastured meat and conventional meat. Um, you one would need to eat eight pounds of pastured 
beef to get the same amount of omega-3s that you get out of two ounces of salmon. Right. So it's not really the place to talk about omega-3 versus omega-6s. But when you, you look at like zinc and magnesium and iron and all these other things, like just the, the takeaway is that meat is really, really, really nutritious, particularly beef. When we start getting into chicken and pork and stuff like that, there's some of these other you know, considerations that pop up there. But I, I know I'm kind of bouncing around, but those oh, are, you know, some of the big picture stories that we wanted to address. There are a number. So the, the book starts off um, with the health consideration because we had these three topics, health, environment, and ethics. And we thought that we were going to start off with the ethical argument first, but as we started digging into everything, what we noticed was that, and this is, let's put a caveat here. Let's assume that what I'm saying is accurate. I may be totally wrong. It may be totally bullshit. Like history may look back and be like, no, this whole regenerative ag thing it was false. But let's assume for a minute that it's accurate. What we started discovering was that in addition to like the production side being critical for the health of grasslands and and biodiversity and all these other things when we were looking at the health consideration for humans it's really really hard to grow humans in a healthy fashion completely absent animal products and when we look at some vegan and vegetarian cultures, there's only been a vegan cultures for a relatively brief period of time, like 50 to 60 years, really. And, you know, we've had uh, more vegetarian based cultures like India and some places like that, um, different, different Buddhist countries. But you very consistently see a, a challenge with um, B vitamins, iron, zinc. You see a shortened stature. You see problems with the dental formation. Um, you know, there's there's a very predictable set of circumstances, and it, it it it's very similar. You only see things like that in developed countries in very poor segments of the population who are forced to eat a super monochromatic, starch rich diet. You know, they right. don't get access to animal products, and you see these similar failures to thrive. But what we ended up finding was it was interesting. We were going to tackle the ethical topic from the perspective of veganism is not a bloodless affair, you know, like factory combines collecting beans and, and grains and whatnot. It kills a lot of animals. It, applying herbicides and pesticides kills a lot of organisms. And that's all, I think, really important stuff. But it changed the equation a lot when we realized that, um, it is damnably hard to have a healthy pregnancy and to grow a, a viable, healthy human being on vegan and vegetarian diets, vegan in, in, in particular. So how does that change the ethical consideration? Like if we're, we're uh, particularly for, um, you know, like the previous year, there was so much uh, global unrest around like social justice topics. We are telling people who are already poor and already living at the margins that the way that they should be eating is vegan, which is, in, in my opinion, going to further exacerbate health issues, developmental issues, the, the disparity between um, height, stature, intelligence because of, of superior nutrition. And I think, think that there, there's a big ethical, like, you know, thing that we need to have a discussion around all that. And so, those things ended up changing it such that we started off with health and we really got in and looked at, you know, are the claims around the challenges of meat consumption and animal product consumption accurate, you know, with like cancer and diabetes. And, and that's actually pretty easy to unpack. Like if somebody has a little bit of patience to read that, like you can, you can unpack that pretty quickly, healthy user bias, um, uh, pretty shoddy epidemiological research, food frequency questionnaires. Like it, it, if you can get somebody's attention for a little while, you can kind of go through that. The, the environmental piece gets interesting because we had to actually get in and talk about basic ecology because we had been at some conferences where people are so divorced from the food system. They just had no, they're like, doesn't food, just, like when people would talk about um, lab grown meat as, as an example. They're like, well, it just grows. And we're like, what do you feed the lab meat? And they're like, well, you would just feed it stuff. You know, and it's like, well, where does that shit come from? You know? right. It's, like, right. it's the product of the industrial row crop food system. And you've got right. to 
grow all of it, process it, you know, whittle it all down. Then you've got to inject it into a vat. That vat needs, you know, lighting and heating and air conditioning and the infrastructure. And this is all versus like grasslands, sun, photosynthesis, you know, and, and, uh, right. So we had to go through this whole thing, uh, a model of like a planet that um, starts off simply and then gets more complex, like the the evolution of life on a planet. And we called it grass world. And, and it kind of walks people through this thing. We, we received a remarkable amount of positive feedback with that because people, what it painted was that we really want as diverse an ecology as we can have and as diverse a food system as we can have. And a animal centric system is, can be remarkably diverse. It can be far more diverse than what we have going on right now. Like, I think we should be eating way more sheep and goats and camels and all kinds of weird right. stuff like that, you know, versus just, just so monochromatic with beef it, in the Americas and, you know, uh, the United States and Canada, we should be eating far more bison than beef because it actually evolved here, you know? Yep. So that's a whole other thing to that. But those two things together, the health piece and then the environmental piece, we we did a pretty good job, I think, looking at, you know, some considerations around that, like water usage is a big one. People will say that cattle use a huge amount of water, but the what they're doing in that circumstance is is ignoring the reality that the water that is allocated to, say, like beef production is the water that falls on grasslands. Like it is the reason why the grasslands live. And these grasslands have co-evolved with grazing animals for millennia. I mean, since literally, you know, dinosaur times, we have models that look a whole lot like bison and wolves and, and you you know, that predator prey interaction. So grasslands have been a feature of, of, you know, the global environment since, since complex life has, has really formed on the planet. And it's ridiculous to to equate it, it, people couch the the usage of water for for beef in particular as if it was being stolen from somewhere else and could be used from for some other allocation and we can uh, categorize water it, usage as green water which is snow rain you know mist type precipitation that that falls on the land Blue water, which is lakes, rivers, and streams, and then uh, also includes some below ground aquifers. And then there's gray water, which is the wastewater from sewage and also from from animal husbandry and whatnot. Even in conventional beef production, ninety four to ninety percent six percent of the water that is used is green water. It, unless you you build some way to catch water on massive scales in a grassland, which is going to steal the water away from the grassland. Like there's, there's no other use for this stuff, you know, or there's no other way to capture it and, and use it. And it's interesting because things like almonds are something like 96 to 98% groundwater fed. Mm. And so they're completely, they really are the thing that is like, that is stealing water in a way that cannot be recharged at the rate that is being removed Something like 80% of the almonds produced in the United States are exported to China. So we're exporting groundwater to China in the form of almonds. And that's a healthy plant-based material, but right. you know, evil cows. And so, I mean, this is the stuff that we had to go through. We just had dozens and dozens of these different, you know, kind of hot button topics and uh went through and built this case for why it's probably good for our health good for the environment. And also at the end of the day, as, as tough as it is to, to come to terms with a, a, a living vibrant planet means a planet with lots of death, like things live and they die. Um, I, I don't go on social media that much, but whenever I poke my nose into uh, Instagram, like uh, nature is metal, that, that, that yeah. account That's pops up and it's like, you know, a hyena pulling a, a giraffe baby out of the mom giraffe while both of them are still alive. And you're like, right. holy shit, man, you know, but it, it, and then when you look at that versus like, OK, you know, Joel Salatin makes the case that for his cows, they have one bad day and it's the day they go to slaughter. And even yep. that bad day isn't that bad of a day, all things considered. Like they're very careful to keep them calm and all that. But beyond that, like they're protected from predators. They take good care of them. They get all the food they want to, you know, you know, like they're 
they're pretty squared away. They have a much easier life than what they would in a, a quote, natural environment. And so, yes. I mean, that's all the stuff that we we did with the book. The, when we turned in the first manuscript for Sacred Cow, it was 600 pages. And the editors were like, this isn't going to going to work. We're going to have to get it down to about half that. And they did a really good job helping us to edit it and keep the, make the story more concise, but there's so many nuances and details. And we had to keep that stuff in there. Like it would be super easy to just say, well, meat isn't a problem with grasslands done, you know? And for some people though, because they're, they're, uh, the pro meat or, you know, whatever they might take it at face value, but with the, it, the climate change and all this, the, um, instead extenuating circumstances to that deserves a really fair and honest and thorough treatment. And it's not doing any of that. If we, we just dismiss these things out of hand. So it, it takes a lot of nuance and detail. And the big challenge that we have our our side of this discussion, there is no elevator pitch. There is no you know, super pithy, short, concise, you know, thing that that wraps all this stuff up. We start talking about economics and thermodynamics and ecology and and you can't not do that unless you're just going to do this ridiculous hand waving and and just hope that people kind of kind of buy into it. So I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into health because I hear this all the time. You know, there's there's the longevity camp now that's like, hey, mTOR is bad, don't eat meat. And then there's, you know, this other camp that says, hey, muscle is important. And I just love to, you know, even before we get into that stuff, talk about kind of the general discoveries around meat in general and, and its implication in health, what you found as far as that. And, and a little more specific, if you can be, around when you found that uh, regeneratively grown um, meat versus uh, industrially grown meat uh, is, you know, not different health wise. What were the actual measures of that? So, like, I'm curious if you saw, elevated levels of glyphosate in one versus the other. And would that be considered toward the health markers? Yeah. So, so in, and you know, the the toxicant thing, we didn't get into a lot because there wasn't a, a a ton of material. What we looked at that was just purely uh, essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, because we felt like that was the most credible thing that we could do for that. The bioaccumulation story I think is legitimate, but there's, the science was sketchy enough that I didn't feel comfortable like wading into the pool on that one way or the other. But right. if we constrain the the conversation, ju- now, th- if we constrain the conversation just to essential, uh, 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 globally accepted essential nutrients, then there just wasn't that massive delta between the two of them. In in meat, in dairy, there is a massive difference between mm-hmm. pastured versus conventional. Is Eggs, the data there's in your a massive book? difference. Is the, data the data is in the book. Yeah. yeah, I'd love yeah. To see that. And also uh, uh, sacredcow.info. Diana has created all of these infographics around these specific topics and has the references in there. Awesome. Like it is a really beautiful uh, website. She was an artist before she was a, a scientist. So like she's awesome. able to bring that, that easy uh, information conveyance there. So that's a valid point. That's a valid uh, point. But I, I, we didn't feel confident enough in the information around some bioaccumulation stories. Like it's not as clear cut as things like ocean, uh, large ocean fish, like apex predator fish being super uh, uh, compromised with like mercury toxicity and right. stuff like that. Like we just didn't see that same robust information and also a clear vector of, of a problem. But it's real easy to make the case that if you've got a little extra money, and you want to support the environmental side, then it's clear cut that that doing the the pastured or regenerative process is usually the superior piece. But even there, there's some nuance to it. Maybe about 20 to 30% of the meat that ends up in the conventional pipeline, you know, it ends up in Costco and 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 uh Walmart and all that stuff. Those people are raising it regeneratively, they just offload it. At, to a feedlot to be finished, but their whole operation is regenerative, like like from start to finish. But just economically, it doesn't make sense for them to finish it. So even in that circumstance, it's not a one hundred percent one way or the other thing. And then even beyond that, like let's say the 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 least favorable, the, the other seventy to eighty percent of the meat that that is fully in the conventional pipeline. 
70% of its life is spent on grass. So it still is more regenerative than like pork or chicken, which is a hundred percent dependent on, uh, you know, grain and soy inputs. And, and this is again, where the, um, the real meat elitists hated us in the book and the film, like that, because it just, there's all these bumpy pieces to it. You know, it's not this, this really nice, um, uh, concise deal. So I, I, you know, the, the bioaccumulation thing is something I think we need to look at and that may sway things in the future. I, I would also make the case that conventionally raised beef, it only needs a nudge to become fully regenerative. Like it's not that far off, which again is something that, that people kind of lose their minds about. Like they, they think that it's gotta, gotta be this huge bridge, but it's really not. I, ironically though, we've been told to eat more chicken primarily. And then we also tend to eat more pork. And those things are actually quite far of a field from, it was only in the 1940s with the industrialization of our food system and like the development of the Haber-Bosch process for, for nitrogen fertilizer that chicken began to take prominence as a primary meat source. Like, and I don't know if it was in Canada that, that this was a, a saying, but in the United States during a, a uh, presidential election, one of the, the, one of the, the, people running said that there will be a chicken in every pot because chicken used to be a, a once a month, once every once in a while delicacy, because it's a secondary food source in in like a, in an ecological perspective, uh, sheep, goats, cows, those are the primary movers because of their ability to eat large amounts of like cellulosic material and turn it into, into meat. So, um, so let's see here, the, the environmental health. Um, so would you go so far as to say that in general, if you're eating uh, conventionally raised meat, then you're, you're better off choosing beef than chicken or pork? Just to kind absolutely. of summarize it. Yeah. From, from both a health, from a nutrition standpoint, and then also from an environmental standpoint, yes. And this is one of the ironic things, like Leonardo DiCaprio has this huge film that was uh, co-sponsored by the uh, National Geographic Society before the flood. And he goes through and he, 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 in my opinion, falsely uh, details challenges around beef production. Like it, I, I think he takes it very out of context, not, not a great depth to it. And at the end of the film, he makes the primary recommendation is to shift away from beef and towards chicken. But chicken is 100% raised on grains and soy right. products. And, right. and they're in confined area feedlots. And there's another little nuance to that. Industrial chicken production is only possible due to massive inputs of antibiotics. Mm. And that is one of the primary vectors of the loss of antibiotic efficacy is, is these confined area uh, feeding of chicken and pork. And uh, Diana Rogers actually was paid by Merck to go to Southeast Asia and give a sequence of talks there because they're really trying to encourage the farmers there to shift to a regenerative form of, of chicken and pork production. Because if we if we lose the ability to, for, for antibiotics to work on animals, we lost them on humans. And then like our world changes dramatically without antibiotics. And so they're really trying to, to get out ahead of that. So yeah. To, so is, is it possible to grow chicken without soy and grains? Like, is there anyone doing it? Even if it's organic, even if it's pasture, like rarely, any- rarely, really? but you can shift it so that their, their diet isn't exclusively that, that uh, uh, soy and grains. And they're at least playing this role of getting out in like, uh, turning over the, the manure and eating bugs out of that and spreading things around. Um, you, especially in temperate areas where, where it gets cold in the winter and you may get snow, you're always going to have that as at least somewhat of an input. But the thing is, is that if you decentralize that and make them not a central feature, then they, they, uh, you're getting better efficiency out of the whole system. And you're also getting a more nutritious, you know, eggs, more nutritious, uh, uh, chicken meat and whatnot. And you're not getting all those kind of environmental downsides, but it, it even, <sighs> We didn't go super deep on this, but it's as far back as like mid 1800s, maybe even later than that, that, you know, in certain areas, um, animals would be overwintered with stored grains. So th- this isn't a, a brand new thing. It's just been industrialized and kind of ramped up more in, in more recent times, for sure. 
Yeah. Interesting. So what would be some of the downsides of eating? So I'm going to guess beef is probably a predominant source of protein in your diet. Yep. And as, as with many people that we probably have in common and curious, what would you see as some of the downsides? With beef consumption specifically yeah. or yeah. Yeah. Um, possibly iron overload for, for some people. Like I do get my, my iron checked occasionally and I, I just donate blood. It, it's somewhat of a, a, you know, consistent clip. And, and so that would, that would be about the only, you know, yeah. real downside. Like the nutritional profile is phenomenal. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and as far as ratios of muscle to organ meats, are you balancing those things out pretty well? I'm not. And I know that there are some people who are really geeked out on that. And, um, uh, I've spent years not balancing that out. I've spent years balancing it out and I'll be damned if I could tell any difference one way or the other. Um, uh, we do some liver, like I'll, I'll take liver and, uh, I'll, I'll, what we do is the folks that process the meat for us, they will make a liver, uh, uh hamburger blend. And then yeah. I will put that in taco meat and things like that. Um, uh, we'll do like some, some, uh, beef heart chili. So we do eat a fair amount of it, but I'm not, I just kind of tick through it. And it's not like this hair on fire thing where like every day I'm trying to make sure that I'm, um, balancing all that. I do a fair amount of bone broth though. Like I, I do just in, in passing, like I, I, I have been more fastidious about doing that. And I think that there's some legitimate concerns around like the, the glycine methionine ratio. And that, that might be the most compelling piece of, of the, the whole story there. But I, I know there are some folks that are just like diehard, like you must eat all the organ meats and it, it's, um, I'm hard, but like, I do think that there's something to like, if something tastes really, really good, we're probably kind of drawn to it. And there's some stuff like, kidneys it's no way no. on god's green earth that i i can eat those with with a you know without being near starvation and and um you know even heart like i like it but i need to fix it correctly um right. i do like tripe a lot like i eat a lot of pho and and menudo and stuff like that and so i yeah. will make that so it does make its way into into the mix and into my family's diet but i'm not I'm not neurotic about it. Like it just kind of pops up in a, a fairly random fashion. Very cool. So let's talk about the environmental considerations. So you've mentioned carbon sequestering. You've mentioned water consumption. I'd like to go a little bit deeper in this carbon sequestering because that's the one you hear all the time. Everyone's right. like, you can't eat cows because it's destroying the environment. And it sounds like that's not true. Yeah. And, you know, two thirds of the earth's land mass is grasslands. And they're literally amenable for nothing other than growing grass. And, uh, the the bummer is that the areas that can do other things like farming or uh, the irony is that the thing the places that are amenable to farming are all, also usually really good for like strip malls and so we've converted a lot of the grassland areas into either farmland or or you know suburban areas but these these grasslands historically particularly in the, in this central part of the Americas like from Mexico all the way up into Northern Canada, it was these huge prairies and grasslands that had enormously thick uh, topsoil. And that topsoil is a product of the, uh, you know, eons of inter interaction between the plants, the land, the animals, the, the carbon dioxide that's getting squashed out of, out of the, uh, the atmosphere. But the, the primary backbone of that, that uh, topsoil is carbon. And the, the, the you know, the, this is where people will kind of go back and forth on this. They're like, well, the amount of carbon that you can pull out of the atmosphere ends up topping off at, at some point. And so it, the uh, total carbon sink ends up becoming more minimized. That might be true, but the, um, we don't really, we don't know the full extent of that. And there is definitely the, the flip side of this, which is that if we are eroding topsoil, which is definitely something that happens with either overgrazing or undergrazing of an area, then that, that's another net release of carbon. It's also changing the way that those lands store water. Like the, these uh, perennial grasses, there are these wonderful pictures where they'll, they'll you know, like take a cross section out of a hill yeah. and they'll show, you know, the layers of, of not just the soil, 
but they'll show the root beds of these grasses and they're like 20 or 30 feet deep. It's amazing. Yep. And this stuff is incredibly good. It, like uh, uh, farmers will oftentimes talk about, it's not how much rain you get, it's how much rain you keep, you know, and, and these grasslands end up retaining massive amounts of water, which helps to recharge aquifers below ground, uh, reduces the albedo of the, of the area. So the amount of, of kind of reflected light ends up changing. So it doesn't heat the planet or the atmosphere as much as what it would if that area desertifies, which is one of the, the main problems that we, we see with, um, ironically with modern industrial agriculture, like that row crop agriculture destroys the topsoil and we end up right. with, with this encroachment of, of desertification. And, and so the, the carbon sequestration piece, I think is still kind of up in the air. It's a little bit of a coin toss. We don't know how much topsoil we make. We're still not entirely clear uh, how much carbon gets sequestered underground because there's this whole network between the, uh, the roots of the grasses and the different plants, bacteria, fungi, like there's a, there's an economy that goes on there where like some of the fungi mine minerals out of the, the, the rocks share that with bacteria in exchange for carbon, for glucose that has been, you know, shared out of the plant. And then that gets shared into the plant and that's where potassium and magnesium and zinc and these different things come from in many cases. So there's this whole complex system going on there that I don't think we we fully have a grasp of. But Alan Savory has made the case that even if if um, there was zero carbon capture potential in this story, which I don't think is is true, but let's say it's it's absolutely zero. Just the fact that you can reverse desertification with this regenerative ag approach is very is compelling enough that we should do it because desertified areas produce no food for anyone. It increases the heat footprint of the planet. You know, uh, all the topsoil washes away, no ecosystem and on and on and on. So even um, the examples that we've seen in Australia, Africa, and, and we detail it in the film in the Chihuahuan desert where there, this guy has reversed a million acres of desertification and turned it back into grassland. Like it's amazing. So just the the reversing of desertification is probably compelling enough to 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 justify this this whole operation but there still is is kind of this unknown piece to the carbon sequestration story that we we just don't quite yet know for sure what that that full accounting is because of the complexity of the whole system hey guys i interrupt this podcast to bring you a special message from mass zymes Enzymes are something that I've become an incredible advocate of over recent years, just learning more and more about uh, the degradation of our enzyme systems as we age, stress, inflammation, oxidative stress, sometimes take away from the body's ability to ultimately process food and ultimately produce enzymes. And anyone over the age of 40 should be considering supplementing with some type of enzymes. Anyone who's consuming a gram per pound uh, of, of protein per day or more, or even a little less than that, should strongly consider taking proteolytic enzymes to support protein digestion. If you're someone who feels like maybe you're not recovering, my first suggestion is don't eat more protein. My first suggestion is use more protein that you're consuming. We don't want to consume more food and have it cause an expensive bathroom visit. We want ultimately to uh, consume, digest, absorb, and assimilate what we eat. So that starts with obviously chewing and then progresses into making sure your body has enough hydrochloric acid and enzymes. Both of these things you can get when you go over to masszymes.com and uh, use the code muscle to get hooked up. It's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S, masszymes.com and use the code muscle. Got it. How about methane? So we hear something about methane excretions of the cows. I know yeah. nothing about it, but I'm curious what, what's going on there. Methane is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. So uh, different gases. So like oxygen, when sunlight passes through it, it doesn't absorb any appreciable amount of heat. But certain charged gases like methane, like carbon dioxide, when they're polar in their kind of chemical structure, when light passes through them, they have a tendency to absorb solar radiation and they they can can heat and this is where the greenhouse effect occurs. Like most of uh, a, a car window is a good example of this. Like it allows light through, 
the light hits the, the you know the interior of the car and then when it gets reflected back it gets reflected in the form of infrared radiation primarily and the windshield is is uh it's like a two-way mirror it allows regular light to go through but it doesn't ar- allow the infrared radiation the heat to go back out not at the same rate so it's basically like it comes in and then it, it stores in the form of heat and that's how you could get a just incredibly hot car uh, venus is an example of a, a planet with a greenhouse gas you know process that is has gone fully crazy and and uh it's sulfur dioxide gas and uh surface temperature of venus is something like 500 to 800 degrees so i mean the greenhouse effect is a, a legitimate thing but methane is absolutely a potent a greenhouse gas, but we need to really categorize these things carefully because methane is a part of a massive number of biological processes. Like termites produce methane, shellfish produce methane, and I mean prodigious amounts of methane. There was a, a piece in the journal Physics a couple of years ago that was talking about how the the shellfish population off of Great Britain was something like two to three times the greenhouse, the methane emitter that the total cattle herd of like that, that Northern North Western part of Europe is. So then they said, well, maybe we should eradicate shellfish. And it's like, (laughs) you know, this is the danger of, of uh, ascribing all this, this blame to uh, certain types of, of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, We really should look at, the effects of transportation and the carbon emissions and and greenhouse gas emissions from transportation very differently than what comes out of biogenic sources like cows and termites and all that type of stuff. But the long and short is is that cows do absolutely produce uh, methane. Methane is a fairly potent greenhouse uh, gas. It only has a half-life of about 10 years. So every 10 years, the amount that was released, you know, has dropped by about 50%. And it's critical to remind people methane at its core is a carbon and four hydrogens. So it's carbon that was pulled out of the atmosphere by plants. Those plants are eaten by cows. So it's part of a carbon cycle. And this is something that, that gets lost in this whole story. And one of the kind of inconvenient things that has popped up of late when we start looking at this whole topic of, of climate change is the planet is getting greener because the carbon dioxide content is higher. Uh, uh, Back in the the day, not that long ago, but when people were were growing marijuana indoors illegally, they would um, steal uh, uh, CO2 canisters from like... uh, restaurants and and you know soda shops and stuff like that because they would leak in extra carbon dioxide into the the greenhouse because it would accelerate it, that was a rate limiting step to the ability of of plants to grow so one of the ironic things that we're seeing is that plants are actually growing more and growing faster now with higher carbon dioxide levels now nobody knows what what the ultimate you know a uh, uh, story is with that but it may actually make crops grow faster it may make more, you know, jungly areas or plant, you know, areas with plants to grow faster, but there's kind of a mitigating effect w- with that on climate change. So again, it's, it's quite complex and there's a lot of moving parts to the, to the whole story. Yeah. So net in general, what's your thought around uh, specifically cows in this case and global warming? Net, net. I just don't think it, it it's a, uh, these biogenic sources, the life basically, I don't think is where you want to look at the the input there. Definitely, transportation sector is a place that you would you would want to look at very carefully. Even there, though, and this gets into you know controversial territory, but I think you have to be really careful how you how you do all the accounting and also the modeling on that stuff. You know, it, it's. Uh, uh, the Netherlands is two thirds below sea level, and they've been dealing with climate change and the elevation of the sea levels for four or five hundred years, and they've just continued to build levees and and stuff like that. So even in that context, like, and this gets far afield, it gets outside the the scope of what uh, Sacred Cow talks about. But we need to really have discussions around. Okay, climate change is happening; it's a real thing. There are probably things we should do around it, but 
are we better off trying to help poor countries get wealthier by by you know growing their economy and growing infrastructure and whatnot to help them to deal with the effects of climate change like people with functioning electrical infrastructure and air conditioners deal with climate change and, and the ability to to elevate roads and roadways and stuff like that can deal with situations much more effectively than very poor countries like the in the United States um hurricanes are very expensive uh, it, because things are more valuable and there's more infrastructure now but far fewer people die as a consequence of severe weather events because people's houses are built better and there's more infrastructure and whatnot yeah. so this again this is probably a book for 10 more years down the road but you know cr- trying to look at some of these externalities around the the economics of climate change and and try to again kind of thread the needle between these these things but net net i don't think cattle are the place to look at for climate change you know to change it one way or the other and and this is and here's where this is is really honestly quite dangerous like if people are like rob's an idiot this is all bullshit okay fine but there were claims that were made that were perpetuated online from from credible you know scientific uh, outlets that 70 to 80 percent of climate change is driven by animal husbandry by cattle specifically and when you really dig into that, it it's at best around two percent of the the net contribution is right. caused by by cattle. So at a minimum, it's critical that we get these these questions right. Like if we're operating with terrible information, with inaccurate information, we will make terrible decisions around right. that. So yeah, yeah. So what's one of the things that you learned that was maybe a surprise during this whole process? I'm sure you learned a ton with all the research. I mean that that thing of around um, conventional meat and and pastured meat not having as big a delta between the nutrition yeah. was a, an eye opener and and uh, we paid an independent PhD researcher to review that information hoping that we got it wrong because we knew that that was going to be a shit show and uh, and it, it just kind of was what it what it was the guy came back with virtually identical you know analysis right. to what we so, had done one thing that was interesting is. Uh, we really better understood what a disaster this whole story is for like developing countries and in like marginalized populations like if we the the push for our, our global food system is that we have these monocrops that are controlled as it stands right now something like 95% of the planet's food is produced by like six companies, six, nine companies, like it's incredibly consolidated, but they want even further consolidation on this. But it it was an eye opener that um, there would be no room for traditional food systems in this story. Like uh, Diana looked at at some of the um, the Canadian government sponsored uh, food recommendations for some of the Inuit tribes that, that live very far north. Is fucking like box cereal and orange juice, and and at the top of the pyramid was was traditional diet, it, and it said that it said traditional diet, and um, I just found that stunning, you know, and particularly when you look at like the diabetes the epidemic that is is plaguing these folks, and yeah. and uh, I just couldn't believe that, but this is this thing that is being kind of pushed out in mass, and interestingly, about the only place that you see really concerted pushback against this uh, globalization of the food system is in developing countries. And it's in places that they're like, we don't want to be solely tied to the, the, you know, the uh, farm outputs of the United States and Europe. You know, we want autonomy. We want our traditional food systems. Yes, we we want to be part of a globally networked economy and everything. But um, that was interesting that there was actually some, some remarkable awareness and pushback from developing countries and from uh, different ethnicities and minorities around this idea that a mainly white, mainly vegan centric model of the world should be the dominant food system. Like it's so ironic given, you know, the past couple of years of like social justice awareness and whatnot. Like that was a, that was an interesting eye opener and honestly a bit of um, a bit of a, a ray of hope because I'm a white male who's married to a woman. And so like my, my social capital is, is crap, you know, like my, my opinion is, it carries little weight, but when you start having a, uh, 
First Nations tribes and and uh, you know groups in South America that that represent you know multiple hundred year long food traditions, saying, "Hey, we don't want genetically modified you know food as the staple of our our world, and we, we want to maintain our traditional food systems." When they start pushing back, that actually has some some legit weight and gravitas to it. So that that was maybe the most profound thing, and because it was uh it was kind of a depressing process because it just seemed like every turn that we we got into uh it was uh we were being out competed out flanked out messaged out moneyed and then it was at this really decentralized grassroots level um that people were like no we don't want this and we're not going to take this right. and it'll be interesting to see how this stuff goes i i will throw out one one thing along that line is when um when big tobacco kind of got got it, its hand slapped uh, 20, 25 years ago, they doubled down on going into the developing world and, and were remarkably successful in doing that. And largely the same thing is happening with junk food and, and highly processed food. Like as the big food producers are being held more accountable, you know, in developed countries, like they're really doubling down at trying to get this stuff into um, developing countries. And it's... Uh, the, the morality is just appalling and the the effects it's going to have in these places are are going to be catastrophic if we can't get out ahead of it. So one of the things you said earlier was that veganism has only been around 50 or 60 years. And I think that statement may be very surprising for some of our listeners to hear. So talk to me about that. And there's, there's some stories behind that I've heard behind kind of the origin of veganism, where it came from. And, I, and I'm curious, um, you know, where, where you, you've heard or where the science is behind it, it only being on 50, 50 or 60 years. And, um, you know, maybe why that's not the best way to approach nutritional. Obviously, when, when someone's growing a baby, we know that. Or when a child is growing, hopefully we know that too. Uh, but maybe it's not an assumption we should make. We should probably talk about it. Yeah, you know, we it, part of, and Diana was really kind of the expert on on this side of it because she she went really deep into the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church and mm-hmm. and um, where that developed. And within the Seventh-day Ad- Adventist religion, they're not vegan, but they're vegetarian. You know, it's a it's kind of an offshoot of Christianity that, that interprets the Bible in such a way that you're supposed to be uh, vegetarian. And then uh, like Kellogg, Lee Harvey, uh, or, yep. God, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, Kellogg, yep. you know, like cornflakes and all that. Yep. He was in this early, uh, you know, uh, late Victorian era um, health spas, sanitariums, you know, water therapy. It's kind of where naturopathy was with birth out of and is part of the reason why naturopathy still has such a powerful steeping in vegetarian and, and vegan diets. But um, he developed these, these sanitariums and then this uh, cornflakes because um, they felt like... Uh, uh, Animal products led to um, sexual desire and impure thoughts. And if they fed these people this really bland, and now we understand like nutritionally devoid diet, that it it suppressed randiness, you know, at the the end of the day. So there's there's kind of an interesting um, story around the growth and development of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and where they were really the founders of the registered dietetics movement, which is also why dietitians have such a powerful orientation towards this kind of vegan vegetarian kind of kind of mindset. But you know, prior prior to the early 1900s, there just wasn't really the the infrastructure for people to. One, we didn't know about vitamins at a super sophisticated level. So there was some understanding that there was something about animal products that that kept people alive. Like if, uh, and now we recognize that that's probably B12 and other B vitamins, you know, zinc deficiencies and, and things like that. There were certainly um, traditional preparation methods like soaking, sprouting, fermenting that improve the nutritional profile of, of uh uh, some foods, uh, some some real hardcore uh, folks in the vegan scene um, make the case that uh, uh, because these these food products were traditionally processed in such a way that fecal matter was not excluded from them wholesale, that it allowed some B vitamins to make it into there. And I'm kind of hazy on that whole thing, but it was literally that like 
shit was saving them from, you know, B vitamin yeah. deficiency. It's good. really yeah. wacky stuff and kind of a yeah. tough one to, to package and sell that one. But, um, you know, that, that was kind of in the West, that is kind of the history of the kind of vegan vegetarian, you know, thing. And it had, uh, some elements out of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and then that kind of there was kind of a a waves crashing together, nineteen uh, sixties, nineteen seventies of of kind of Eastern oriented philosophies around more vegan vegetarian approaches, you know, right. Hinduism, Buddhism, and nineteen uh, sixties counterculture, and th- there was kind of an interesting intermarrying of these um, counterculture concepts that came out of the East and then the, the uh, you know, Western Christian Seventh-day Adventist, you know, kind of concepts that, that came out of the, 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 that, that scene. And we, we, Diana does a really good job in the, the book on that. I'm not as good of an expert on it because she wrote that section and I've, I've read it, but I, I didn't right. write that. So I'm, I'm not as well versed in it, but it it, you know, they're just anthropologically, we don't see examples of, of legitimately vegan cultures until very recent in history. And even there, we tend to see more of a revolving door culture than a, a consistently, you know, steadfast uh, culture because people kind of enter and and exit it. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. So I'd love to get uh, down the path of like ancestral practices. So I think one of the things you're most known for around the world is uh, understanding ancestral practices specifically around eating uh, in a way that maybe is most in alignment with our ancestors. And, I'd love to have you maybe just begin by defining what that might look like. I know it's a broad statement, but you could just start at a high level and then we'll chunk down from there. Yeah. You know, it. I don't think the ancestral model is, it is helpful only in asking questions, in my opinion, or primarily huh. in asking questions. You know, I don't think it's the place to draw super hard concrete conclusions but it's a mm. wonderful place to go to go throw a rock in and see what type of ripples we we get mm. out of that and so um you know like amounts and types of protein uh, uh feeding frequency feeding in frequency you know those are are places that we can find some pretty interesting data in it it's fairly clear that within hunter gatherer populations Protein was generally fairly, fairly high. Now, this would vary from location to location. Like if we we look at like the Hadza or the San, uh, who are modern hunter-gatherers, but in these very marginalized environments, um, they're not doing as much big game hunting. Like they're they're kind of uh, really forging the the whole span of the, the ecosystem. And so you see kind of a balanced macronutrient ratio, but in general, you didn't see protein intakes go much below 17 to 20% of total calories. And you didn't really see it go above 30 to 35% of calories. And that's mainly because of a protein toxicity limit. Like at some point, if you, if you overeat too much protein, like the, the body can't deal with the ammonia and the, uh, uh, this is called rabbit starvation within, um, uh, kind of, uh, ancestral health circles. Like there was an observation when people were expanding across the Americas in particular, that if they, they had access to like very lean proteins, like rabbits, and not any carbohydrate or not any significant amounts of fat that they would get sick at some point. And, and it was due to this uh, rabbit starvation. So mm. we kind of had some brackets there. Um, car- carbohydrate and fat intake really varied with season, with location. And, and so I think that, you know, that's, um, uh, you know, something that's really labile. And I think that we see that in our, you know, any type of like, if you run a gym, if you coach people, you just notice, oh, this person does pretty well with more carbs. This person does pretty well with fewer carbs. And maybe that changes over time. But I, I think that that scores up. I think one of the big takeaways that we can have from ancestral eating is that um, protein is really important, both from a satiety standpoint, but also from a nutrient density standpoint. And, the, it, and I know you asked about mTOR earlier, and I'm, I'm actually really excited about that stuff. So maybe we'll dig into that a little bit. But it. um uh, one of the just benchmarks of, of whether it's ancestral eating or, you know, just kind of modern healthy eating. And I, I think again, other than, um, some of the mTOR phobic vegan and, and keto folks, like ironically, there are folks in the keto community that are more terrified of mTOR than like the, the vegans are, they're recommending like 40 grams of protein a day, which I think is, is madness, you know, but, um, 
Outside of that, we see that anybody that works with people and makes a living working with people, particularly around like body composition and, 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 you know, aesthetics and maybe performance to some degree, it's kind of like this gram of protein per pound of lean body mass up to a gram of protein per pound of body weight seems to be a pretty good bracket there. Yep. And then you, you figure out if the person does better on higher carb or lower carb or a combo, but that, that benchmark around protein is so powerful because people, people will overeat carbs or fat if they don't get enough protein. If people get adequate protein, then they will tend to self-monitor spontaneously the, the carbs and, and fat on, on the other side of that. Right. Very cool. So let's get into mTOR and MPK. So, you know, the longevity conversation now is, well, you got to minimize mTOR. You got to increase AMPK. So I'm curious what your studies are showing around that. And ultimately, maybe how we can start to navigate this balance between, yeah, we want mTOR, maybe we want to maintain muscle mass. We also don't want to shorten our life. I'm curious where your mind goes on that. Yeah. Uh, so I did my first article on intermittent fasting with this hope of, of like doing exactly what you said, like kind of finding this, this razor's edge on that in 2005 and it was on intermittent fasting. And by 2006, I just like deeply regretted releasing it because it went out to mainly a CrossFit scene. And these people are like type A over the top, you know, right. it was, well, 16 hours of fasting is good. Then like 22 hours must be better. And I had right. five grams of carbs last month, in addition to my six workouts a, a week and on and on and on. But it, what I noticed was that it was, um, it was kind of a 50, 50, the, the best thing that I saw out of the intermittent fasting thing back in 2005, 2006 was that some people noticed that they didn't necessarily need to eat seven or eight meals a day to maintain the same level of muscle mass, which was right. kind of a, a change out of the old, you know, bodybuilding uh, philosophy and everything. But that was literally like the biggest upside or people would notice, I just have a little more resilience going between meals. Like I don't have to eat every two hours and everything, but I wasn't seeing a bunch of magic either, either performance wise or certainly not metabolically. Like I was seeing kind of weird elevations in, in A1C with some people. And again, it was, it was um, people who were already exercising so much. They already had gone above like ancestral norms with exercise, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, but it's like, if you're going to be a professional athlete or train at the level of a professional athlete, you can't add that much more stress to the system. Like you're already like you're, you're there. Yeah. Can't do a bunch of intermittent fasting. Uh, uh, you can't do a bunch of calorie restriction and everything. So that was just kind of a wake up. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Like that, 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 that's something to kind of note there. And then I just kept following the literature on this stuff because um, I don't want to die. I want to live as long as I can. I've got a pretty hot wife. Like I want to stay in the fight as you know as long as I can on all that stuff. And I found a paper, and I'll, I'll ping this thing to you. It's uh, uh, calorie restriction does not extend lifespan in all organisms, and it's unlikely to do so in humans. Hmm. And it was this review paper, and it made a bunch of interesting points. Some of the points included the comparison that is made between calorie restriction and not is always in the context of a lab fed and raised critter, which these lab fed and raised critters are always unhealthy. Right. They're always unhealthy. They're always like, because they're, they're being fed terrible food and right. they have terrible circadian biology and, you know, all these other, other things. So it made the, it made the case that there haven't been a ton of studies done this way, but in the few examples where organisms like a mouse or a rat was fed a species appropriate diet and it was calorie restricted, it died young. It didn't live longer. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the, the lab raised, but species appropriate diet fed organism lived almost as long as the calorie restricted organisms, only it wasn't hypogonadic cold and had all these other mm -hmm. problems. And so that was super interesting. And so, it, you know, I started digging into mTOR specifically trying to go deep on, on, you know, kind of the, the mechanisms there. And we have mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two, and this really interesting interplay that, that happens there. And I just started noticing these interesting realities that like to identify cancer cells, we have to have an activation of mTOR complex one at some point in the identification process. Otherwise, it, if 
mTOR complex one is overly suppressed. And this is some of the dangers of rapamycin or potentially like really hardcore fasting. If you so take mTOR offline, the immune system can't identify cancer and it, it actually leads to more cancer down the road. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, shit, that's kind of interesting. It sounds like mm-hmm. we want some sort of a punctuated randomized signaling here, not just like an, an on off switch. And so I, I did a talk and I think that it's available generally online. It, it, it's a uh, uh, longevity. Are we trying too hard? And I really went deep on this thing and it's, it's something like 150 slides and 60 minutes. Like I just, I'm going on it. But the, the main takeaway that I have is I don't think, I don't think we should be comparing fasting and calorie restriction and protein restriction with sick obese, you know, lab organisms, what we should use as a baseline is a phenotypically healthy organism. So like for a human, they're metabolically healthy. They lift weights. They have adequate protein. Now tell me how much additional benefit fasting calorie restriction and protein restriction is going to confer on that individual. Is that going to uh, guarantee they don't get cancer? Is that going to guarantee they don't get neurodegenerative disease? Because the thing that I think we're really playing with fire there is that for all of us, we have kind of like a a non-one risk of of cancer, neurodegenerative disease, you know, different things. But we all have a 100% risk of uh, sarcopenia at some point, age-related sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, loss of power production. And I am so nervous with the amount, the volume and intensity of fasting, the calorie restriction, the protein restriction in people who are like, I'm going to turn 50 in in like 14 days. So I'm at this spot where the scraps of muscle I've got, I got to hang on to it because it goes away fast. And, um, and Maybe I end up getting cancer, but it, there's no guarantee that ca- a really uh, hardcore calorie restriction, protein restriction is going to prevent it. C- totally speculative. And again, looking at those mTOR models, they're comparing something that is obese and sick with something that is, you know, calorie restricted. We know that obesity and overfeeding increases the likelihood of all these degenerative diseases, whether it's cancer, neurodegenerative disease, you know, on and on and on. So I don't think it's a really fair comparison there. You right. know, I think the comparison really needs to get back to a, a phenotypically healthy uh, organism and then start doing the comparisons. But, um, you know, one of the weird other things that pops up. So mechanistically, this stuff doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think that it's a poor cost benefit uh, analysis. Um, I, it, the, the degree of protein and calorie restriction necessary in theory to get the benefits later will negatively impact our lives today. Like you end up being cold and hypogonadic and, you know, all these, these other things. Then we've, we've got the, you know, kind of the uh, additional piece here which gets back out to the macro level, which it's crystal clear that aging populations who consume more protein age better. Like Mm. they stay out of restrooms, they have better bone mineral density, they have more muscle density. So this is one of the, and it's funny, like one of the, the tons and tons of money thrown at Olympians to try to figure out the difference between gold medal and bronze. And the most consistent thing that they found was a difference in protein intake between a higher protein with gold medalists, a little bit right. less in silver, a little bit less in bronze. And that was oh. one of the, the most uniform things there. And again, looking at like rest home data and, and aging data, those individuals that seem to consume the most protein had the best metabolic health, had the best bone mineral density, had the, the fewest, you know, slip and falls and all the rest of that type of stuff. So I'm really I, I'm not of the opinion that like trying to become a uh, amateur bodybuilder is the way to go, but I think you eat that like gram of protein per pound of body weight. You try to get to like a double body weight, deadlift, a body weight and a half, you know, back squat, um, body weight and some change bench press, do lots of movement and mobility. You're going to age pretty fucking well. And maybe, maybe you do get cancer, but even then you're in a position where you're, you're, you're the healthiest you could possibly be to be able to fight it. You know, right. and and it, it, if your glycemic control is great, your likelihood of neurodegenerative disease is super low. And if people want to drop in like 
three days a month of fasting or three days a quarter of fasting. I think that's great, but I don't, I think once you are lean and healthy and metabolically, you know, firing on all cylinders, I don't see what the benefit is of, of fasting relative to adding an additional day of strength training in your rotation. And I cannot see a single adaptation to calorie restriction and protein restriction that we do not see from exercise. Like I can't see one mechanistic benefit that you don't get from either zone two cardio or strength training. I, it, you not, at, not one of them. Have you looked at the concept of X differentiation? No, no, I'm not even, no, no. So that's, that's a new discovery of Dr. Sinclair. So worth checking out. He just, he just dropped a couple of podcasts. Okay. He's, he's now saying that it's not even a theory anymore. It's proven that this is the mechanism of aging. And this is also the mechanism behind every disease. So from anything from heart disease to diabetes, to Alzheimer's X differentiation. Oh man. Um, yep. <laughs> So that may be the the piece in the puzzle that we're missing because he's saying, do all these other things matter? Yes, but only in as much as they're directly influencing X differentiation. Hmm. So I guess it's this concept of when you're, when you're, say your brain cells, for example, are transcribing new DNA, if the DNA isn't laid down properly, again, I'm not, I'm not a, a, an expert in how DNA transcribes itself. If it's not DNA, if it's not laid down properly, if it's some way disformed or the proteins aren't folding correctly, it reads the protein incorrectly and actually creates a cell that's not maybe a brain cell in that case. And mm. it produces a cell that's, you know, say a kidney cell or something. Right. And so that cell becomes something that's different. And that's over time, if that happens enough, it causes degeneration of that organ or that system. And that's the concept of X differentiation. It's really interesting. I've, I've just been looking into Dr. Sinclair a little bit lately. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I haven't heard that term used, but there, there definitely is this interesting. So there's kind of a reality that, that most things head towards entropy, like that most things head towards randomness and chaos and life seems to be, um, sometimes people will say it, it, it's proof that the second law of thermodynamics is inactive, but it's not true because we burn energy to actually fight entropy and uh there is clearly a a trade-off between being overfed which tends to perpetuate these these uh errors like dna encoding errors um uh uh uh, creating enzymes, like if you need an enzyme that that is important for energy production or or for like proofreading DNA, and you get one of those malformed, this is some of the the stuff that that is supposed to occur in say like calorie restriction and whatnot. But again, it's interesting. Exercise does this stuff too. Heat right. shock does this stuff too. Right. So there's a bunch of other stuff in there. You know, a, a, like drink some coffee, get a tan, take a sauna. <laughs> and I'm just not totally, and then lift weights and, and all that. I'm not, I won't know till, you, you know, I'm dead or no, you know, we won't know for a while, but I, my bet is more on that side of stuff, like coffee, yeah. sauna, maybe, maybe some cold exposure exercise. And again, there might be a modicum of, of calorie restriction in the context of a metabolically healthy individual. But I, I think the the thing that gets missed in this is that we're comparing usually clearly metabolically unhealthy individuals, whether, whether animal or human, and then extrapolating that to like calorie restriction. And we know that eating less of bad food is a good thing, but I don't know that it's this, the magnitude of the difference is really as profound as what people make it out to be just absent. If we just get to a level where we're not metabolically broken or diseased from this, this type of process. Yeah. 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 So I want to be super respectful of your time. So I don't want to take any more. We can, we can stay out and talk for two cool. more hours, but cool. I do want to just ask if you have any books that you've been reading in the last couple of weeks or months that would be highly impactful. I always like to ask, you know, people who are kind of at the tip of the spear and what they're doing, what they're super interested in right now, what you're reading. Oh, I'm super embarrassed on this, but I, um, I, I've been, um, schlepping in like, Good. uh, uh, sci-fi fantasy, like Terry Pratchett, who's a, uh, nice. a, nice a British um, sci-fi author. And I just yeah. think brilliant. And I've been reading huh. his Discworld series because I'm, I'm so in so much of this, this type of yeah. stuff that um, when I wind down at night, I just want something kind of, he throws a lot of science in there because he was right. an engineer by training. And so, you, you know, he throws a lot of material in there, but um, it's just funny as hell. And, and it uh, helps me wind down at night. So I've been reading schlock uh, uh, sci-fi fantasy stuff. What's the guy's name again? Terry Pratchett. 
Terry Pratchett. All right, I'll check yeah. it out. We'll link to it in the show notes for anybody that wants to get into some sci-fi stuff. Um, and I don't, I don't want to neglect mentioning Element because it's such a great product. I think our audience should check it out if you can give a shout out to Element. Yeah, it's just the electrolyte uh, company that that I co-founded, and I, I do think that electrolyte insufficiency is kind of a, a, a remarkably underappreciated phenomena in general in kind of the health and wellness space, but particularly like if somebody's on eating on the lower carb side of things, yeah. your, your electrolyte needs, your sodium needs dramatically increase, and I... I'm a pretty good biochemist, but it took me 22 years to, to ask the right people the right questions to realize I was super underpowered in sodium intake. And it, it's just been yep. kind of a lifesaver for me. Yeah. Rob, I appreciate it. I think we could have talked for at least another hour or more. So maybe I'll have to invite you back sometime. I truly appreciate you making the time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. Huge honor. And I will bring down property values anytime you want me to. So uh, I would be honored to come back. Thank you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, ladies and gents, boys and girls, thank you very much for being here. Hopefully you enjoyed my chat with Mr. Rob Wolf. It's been a long time coming. I've known Rob for a while. It's truly an honor to have him on the podcast. Really, really smart guy. I love people who simply walk the walk and talk the talk, right? Rob is someone who's not just sitting behind a desk doing the research and smashing donuts. He's actually putting the rubber to the road and doing what he says he does and actually applying these basic principles in our ancestral living, paleo living and paleo nutrition. So thank you, Rob, for being here. Thank you for what you continue to do. And especially thank you for the movie, The Sacred Cow. It gives us a deeper insight into the reality behind agriculture. And maybe that, that the farming industry isn't as bad as we're sold it to be. Maybe we're being told that by some other uh, communities will say, and again, I don't know the answer. I'm not the one doing the scientific research, but it's always nice to hear both sides of the story instead of just getting this one sort side that says, oh, you shouldn't eat meat because it's bad for the environment. And then Rob coming on and giving us a lot of data as to why it's not. And again, I'm not an expert. I'm not passing judgment. I'm just saying I love hearing both sides of the story so we can ultimately pass our own judgment and feel good about the way we do it. So one more shout out to our amazing sponsor for today's podcast, Bubs Naturals, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash Bubs Naturals. While you're on that one, you're on the Muscle Intelligence website, you can subscribe to our email newsletter. You can uh, subscribe to the podcast and ultimately find so many of our amazing programs, our coaching programs and videos that live on muscleintelligence.com. If you haven't checked it out, do so now an ever evolving uh, website that is soon to be expanding even more with some awesome stuff. Thank you guys for being here. Have a great day and live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. And again, if you enjoy this podcast, I would appreciate it if you would leave us a five-star review. Don't forget to subscribe and share it with at least one person you know and love that would appreciate this content and that also wants to live their greatest life in a body they love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.